Hello everyone, um, I'm Dan Pinchbeck, I'm the creative director of The Chinese Room and this is the Dear Esther Developers Commentary. Hi, I'm Rob Briscoe, I'm the artist on Dear Esther. And I'm Jessica Curry and I was the composer on the game. So what you're looking at today is a remake of a remake of a mod. Um, Dear Esther started off in 2007 as a Half-Life 2 mod um, that did really, really well in the modding community, which was fantastic, and as a result of that attracted the attention of Rob, who worked as the primary developer on a Source remake of the game that was released in 2012. And this year is another remake where the, it's been updated for a cross-platform release, and we wanted to add in this developer's commentary just to give you a bit more of an insight into some of the ideas behind the game as it came together. So you'll see around you in a lot of the environments, there's, there's a lot of detail ingrained into everything. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do with Dear Esther is uh, bring the visuals up to the same kind of level of detail that Dan and Jess had put into the other areas of the game. So um, all of the history and the kind of hidden pieces of story that are intertwined with the VOs and the music and stuff, I, I kind of wanted to bring some of that into the environments. Uh, so if you look around you, you'll see that there's a lot of interesting bits and pieces, a piece of paper with someone's name on it, uh, a photograph, uh, an ultrasound. All of these little bits and pieces are kind of laid in to just kind of bring another aspect of the story uh, into the game. And also, they're actually randomized, so every time you play you'll see something different lying around. And this is just to build on this idea that everybody has a unique experience and a unique uh, interpretation of the story. Part of the point about the whole game, I think, was this idea that rather than having a linear, straight through version of the story, that we could have multiple story units for each place you were and I was really interested in this idea of how you can open up that space that people can interpret so I loved the idea that you could have two people that had played this game and then would uh, have a conversation about it and one of them would say oh what did you think about when this happened and the other person would be like well that didn't happen for me I had a completely different event happen or a completely different story happen and it kind of feels very gamey in that way that actually one of the things I love about writing for games is that you hand over so much control to the player that it becomes their story and that's really, really important rather than trying to force them. So using randomised uh, blocks of voiceover in the game and the kind of randomised prop details that Rob was talking about means that it gives it a really different feeling every time you go through. And that was really, that's kind of interesting for me because I like the idea of going, well, not everyone has to have the same experience and because it's interactive you have the capacity to have very different experiences occupying the same space. So yeah, but balancing all that then becomes a, an I, absolute nightmare. I think it's nice though because everybody gets a personal experience. Like I love reading the forums and seeing how people come, uh, come and they sort of tell their story and what they interpreted of it and then you see other people discussing what they thought of it and to me it's kind of nice because everybody else every, everybody takes something unique away from it When I wrote the music for the mod of Dear Esther there was absolutely no budget whatsoever for uh, live players so all the music was sampled but one of the good things about that is it actually forced me to be quite creative about how I wrote the music. So with my background in sound art, I wanted to use samples in a different way that wasn't just um, using it to sound like a violin. I wanted to time stretch and manipulate samples to make something different and strange and quite unique. Um, but then when we got the Indie Fund money, I had the amazing opportunity to re-record the music with live players. And that was so exciting for me, actually, because that's where it comes to life. And I thought long and hard about whether to write new music, um, going from the mod uh, to the commercial version. But actually, I decided that my initial and original emotional response to the game was probably going to be the strongest response and reaction that I had. So I just literally, the music that I'd written for samples, I then wrote out for uh, live instruments. But what they bring to it 
is transformative, actually. And I think the beach is a really good example of this, where you know you have these awful samples soaring away, and then you have the string quartet playing this very bleak, very sparse music, and they bring the presence of the island immediately to it, and it comes to life. And that's the exciting thing about it. It wasn't a huge budget, but just having that experience of working with the players was just magical. Everything about Esther for me is a dream. The, the landscape is not an island, it's the dream of an island. The music is like music that you've, you wake up because you've heard in your sleep, but you, you're not conscious of hearing it. And the language in the story was supposed to be like that as well. Of It didn't matter the sense it made, it was more about the, the kind of, the shapes it created, if that makes sense. So that the words would kind of, were like, a, like, like being in water, like listening to something underwater, it'd be this, this very dreamlike, symbolic, poetic thing. And it always had frustrated me in games with game writing. This has really changed quite a lot. There was never any space for poetic language. It was very exposition -y, very descriptive, very direct. And you'd have like, art and audio would have these amazing creative spaces they could explore. But when it came down to actually writing, you just had to basically go into the room, describe the character, tell the player what to do. And it just seemed like the most boring thing you could do with words in a game. And why couldn't a writer have the same artistic freedom as a visual artist or an audio designer or a, or a musician in terms of being able to say, isn't this just about creating this, this kind of emotional tone, this emotional space? Um, and it's really, I, I still love that about the game. It's one of the things I love so much about Nigel's voiceover is it has this really odd, disconnected, kind of dreamlike quality to it where you might finish the game and not actually understand anything that happened, but you'd have been carried along in the flow of it. Um, and without any kind of sarcasm at all, I get into trouble saying things like this. The same design principle applies as this to Halo. It's 30 seconds of fun, or 30 seconds of, of depressing engagement, I guess, in our case. But it is about that loop of being in the moment in the game constantly, and that's actually the critical thing that matters. This symbol on the beach, um, which is the uh, golden ratio, is it's one of the only things that's, that's really left explicitly from the mod. In the original mod, there was an awful lot of um, more kind of symbols and uh, kind of a much more kind of mystical, sort of magical element to the island. There was a lot of very weird stuff in there. And a lot of them came out of the commercial version because they felt like they were a little bit explicit. And instead, there's a lot more hidden kind of codes and symbols in there. There's still some, some stuff which you can only actually see or experience if you are not playing the game, if you're looking at it from editor. Um, we had in the original mods things like trees planted to mirror um, the shape of the M5, or there's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of things that are there to represent star clusters and all kinds of things like that. And we'll probably talk a bit more about kind of like hidden details and, and the secrets in the game as we go through. But that was really interesting for us in terms of the design of it, of going, you've got your kind of, your conscious, explicit play experience, but games are always constantly manipulating your mood and your feelings and the decisions you're making. And so really trying to create a space that had all of these kind of subliminals in it was a really interesting thing that we wanted to do, both with the original, and then I think it got lifted up into a much more sophisticated version when we went to the commercial, because Rob Zell to bring that sort of level of artistry to the visuals that really got that kind of uh, sense of hidden meaning in there. And that was really important, given how kind of complex and symbol heavy and poetic the story is, where a lot of it doesn't, again, doesn't actually make any sense, but it's about kind of leaving you with these I guess like the half-life of ideas and thoughts that you can't quite shake that stay with you. So we really were trying to get that blend of, of how music, uh, story and visuals could all create that really sort of uncanny structure that you wouldn't necessarily be able to define properly but you knew it, it kind of had a meaning that was staying with you. So something I wanted to do as an artist um, was create uh, some kind of reward for the player when they explore the island. There are some areas of the game where it's a little bit more quieter, there's, there's no music or there's no voiceovers. So I kind of wanted to create a bit of an incentive uh, for people to explore. And you'll find around the island that these, these kind of like uh, random uh, scattered items that, that uh, 
usually slightly out of place from the environment themselves, but in in another aspect, they actually bring a little bit of uh, story um, to the island itself. Usually to the island or to the to the actual uh, protagonists or, or you know the characters that surround it. Um, so you'll find it around the island these these little props and stuff. Uh, just keep your eye out for it if you're exploring. So people have asked why the um, Dear Esther's set on a Hebridean island. What's really interesting about this is one of those times when your kind of aspirations as an artist and the practical realities kind of dovetail. We knew that we had to have some way of limiting the player from disappearing off the play space. And when we made the original, it was a modern, because it was a Half-Life 2 mod, you kind of had Eastern European city, spaceship, or blasted, desolate landscape. We had three options if you didn't want to start making any other assets. So. It started off with these practical constraints. We don't want to set it on a spaceship. We don't want to set it in an Eastern European city. So it's got to be on this kind of like this desolate landscape. And we want to limit the player. So an island seems like a natural choice. And it's really interesting how you start from that. And we had this big lump of clay on a table that we were carving out paths and things for annoying the cleaners and things like that. And Jess and I were talking and Jess started making sort of snippets of music to kind of go in there. And then all of a sudden we just went, Oh, that's the story. Oh, that's what happened here. But it really started, I think, from the place. And when we started looking at photographs of, of, of Bore, we started going and reading some of the history behind it. Suddenly that was it. And it just was really, really naturally became, this is the place, this is what happened here, this is how it feels. And then everything else kind of coalesced around that. Um, yeah, I think as an artist, it made my job a lot easier because those islands are so kind of like, the, the the environment is kind of hostile. You're out there in the the, the Hebrides. Uh, you've got this kind of like inclement weather. You've got cold rain, snow. It's it's a very kind of uh, it can be a very uh, depressing place to be at times. But it's also at the same time very beautiful. And it's it's this kind of like stark, bare landscape uh, that has that has this beautiful surroundings. So it's in terms of art, I think it really helped me uh, to, to portray a lot of the, the themes in Dear Esther. Um, and there was a natural fit with the music as well. The, the, yeah. It suggested a musical style which was really key, I think. One of the things you're always trying to do as a composer is create memorable themes. And uh, a slight confession is that the probably the most memorable theme, which is uh, Remember in Dear Esther, wasn't actually created for the game. Um, <laughs> Rob's I'm looking shocked! <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually from um, a piece of choral music that I'd written years uh, before, uh, based on a Christina Rossetti poem called Remember. And one of the things I was talking about earlier was how I didn't have any budget. So I had this piece of choral music and I thought, hang on, this is absolutely perfect for Esther, but I don't want to use all of it. So the only bit that you actually get in the game is the first line of the choral piece of music. But that actually went on to form the main theme of the music that I wrote. And I think for me it's really interesting about how things that you've written earlier, years before, sometimes come in really, really useful and fit. So I always tell people and students not to despair if something doesn't get used or doesn't work at the time, because actually there'll come a place or in a time where you think, hang on a minute, I've got something that fits. So in terms of that memorable theme, the remember theme gets used in multi multitude of different ways during the game. And one of the things it does is helps you to identify the kind of psychic place that you're in in the game. Um, so the theme is played in lots of different ways and actually you'll notice that as you go through the game it becomes more and more broken and more and more manipulated and broken down as the player goes through the journey and as you're psychologically struggling to get to the end point in the game. So music's really, really useful for highlighting the psychological mood and 
we talk a lot about psychogeography, which sound, always sounds a bit, oh, um, bit pretentious, but actually I think it's really important to what the three of us did in the game. Yeah, um, absolutely. Dan, maybe you want it's to talk about like the core that. kind of idea about psychogeography. If you're not in the place you're in, is not the place you're in, or, or you create yeah. the place you're in. It's not just as you're here and then the landscape's out there, but you don't navigate like a city by street signs and by those kind of formal things you navigate it by the things which are significant to you in the way that you've lived in that space and i think that was really kind of key to i think it's really central to how the fusion of art and story and music come together in dear esther because it's not a place where we're going right we have to lead the player up here because it's a natural formation and then you would naturally have a piece of music here because you come around a corner but the story, music and art all work around the idea of what's going on in the narrator's head at this point. How do we represent his emotional state relative to this landscape? And again, it's that idea of the game is, it's a dream of a place. It's like a, the idea of it being a fever dream or a coma dream, which obviously ties in a lot with the kind of story and we'll come back to it in a lot more detail when we get to the caves a bit later on. White lines. Yeah. They actually did this. It was really cool. I found this historical document. They used to do this on Bora and the Hebrides. If their disease broke out, really? they'd actually chip out and expose the chalk. I so if you're know. on a boat and you're coming to the island, you'd know not to land because it was infectious, That's which is the coolest, most amazing. It's one of those things where you go, it's almost impossible as a writer to come up with something as cool as that. It just has to be something that was actually done. And it's so sad as well. And I love this bit and the fact that we can do it because it... It feels really real because it references a real thing. And I know there's something really special about that, but it was always one of those bits in the game that I thought, we've got to be able to represent this somehow. We have to be able to get these things in here. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I actually didn't know that was actually based historically in, in real life, but that's that's really cool. Because, I, I mean, I, I my thing about the white lines is that it, is, it was kind of, it was this completely surreal thing, but also it was kind of, it, it just added to the landscape. It's like, whoa, what the hell is that? Um, um, and putting that into the game was was kind of challenging because to me it just seemed like, oh, this is it's going to be really hard to pull off uh, in a way that's kind of realistic. But then when you look at the the kind of art style of the game, it's not really a realistic thing. Like everything is is uh, half imagined. So you've it, in that way it kind of really fit into the landscape and it kind of creates this amazing. Um, Sort of landmark that you that that you see in the environment, and uh, I just find it really interesting to hear about that. You know? I think it's one of those things where it's not a realistic place, and I mean, no game is a realistic mm -hmm. place anyway. But one of those things where understanding that you're making something which isn't real, and you have that kind of capacity to be sort of to explore it artistically, and we'll come back and talk about sort of like it not being realistic. I think in in a little while. But that's really, really important because then you can say it's what it's about what these things kind of represent or how they make you feel as a player, not about going, is this accurate? And I love, mm -hmm. I get really inspired by sort of doing a lot of research into kind of history and things like that with all of our games um, because you can just find those things that just kind of like speak to you. But it's amazing you can find that in like an 18th century book and go, that really speaks to me now. That has meaning now. And that's fascinating, I think. Something that I wanted to bring through in the art of the game was was the same kind of fidelity that you find in the both Jessica's music and Dan's writing, uh, in the same kind of way that you have all of these little details, these very uh, close attentions to detail that that kind of really bring richness to the story. And something that was missing in the original mod version was just this lack of of, of a visual layer of story. Um, and something that I did. Uh, throughout the the art of the game is to add in all these little details here and there, little bits of story, little links to certain things that you may or may not hear or see, um, just a, a layer of richness in the world and give you some kind of reward for exploring. So keep your eye out as you look around. There's a scene in Donnie Darko where Drew Barrymore's playing uh, his English teacher and she talks about cellar door as being the most beautiful word in the English language and about it's the sound of the words together. And Dear Esther actually comes from the introduction to From a Faith No More song, the Crab song on the first album, Introduce Yourself. And there's a point where um, 
I think it's Chuck at that point as the vocalist before Mike Pan just says, Dear Esther. And it really lodged with me because the sound, Dear Esther, just has a, a really amazing sound to it. And I think when we started making it and the idea of it being this series of letters to someone came through, it just came straight back out of going, that's just a really beautiful sounding combination of words. And I think that really sums up the whole approach to the writing in Dear Esther of what's a really, what's the most beautiful combination of words and images we can put together and to do it that way rather than writing a traditional plot as such. So yeah, Dear Esther, Faith No More and Doom, that's where it comes from. I think the central question to the entire experience for most people that have played it or are talking about it is this idea of, is the island real? Is what's going on a literal event of a man walking across a Scottish island or is it a dream that he's had? Does the island even exist? And one of the things that we try to do with the writing is to constantly lull the player into a position where they got an understanding, they made a decision about what they thought was going on and then to undercut it. So you never actually were able to settle on any one interpretation. And that was the challenge I set myself when I wrote the original mod, was can we put a story in a game that not only lends itself to multiple interpretations, but there is no stable interpretation. Every single interpretation you have will always have questions and you'll never be able to fully trust what you think you understand about the game. Um, so it, it's challenging, I think, for that result. It becomes quite a challenging kind of game story because of that, because you don't ever get that situation to go, I understand it now, I can walk away from this thing and it's all closed off and it's tidy. It was a very deliberate attempt to say, no matter where you think you are with this story, you're always questioning whether or not that's right. One of the things that's been most commented on with the audio and the music in Dear Esther is how sparse it is. And that was a really deliberate tactic. I wanted to leave room for the player to think and to dream and to wonder and to put their own interpretation into what was happening. And I think the problem with so much modern media is how bombarded we are constantly. It's the kind of MTV flash in your face, constant music. And Dan and I watch a lot of drama together and that really is constant endless, music. Which is constantly telling you what you should feel, like really clearly. And it's like being kind of beaten up by the music sometimes. And when you read a lot of reviews of Dear Esther, a lot of people say they had this time to think and to interpret. And that was one of their favorite things, that they placed themselves so directly into the game and it's their experience and I think that's actually the greatest success of the game on all points from the story to Rob's art to the music as we all left space for the player to dream. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, places in the game where you see a lot of strange things and uh, this is very deliberate. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is just kind of like not spoon feed the player um, every little piece of story. We kind of just, some things are literally just in there to, to just kind of let you think and let you decide on whatever you want to uh, bring to the story yourself. Um, the, so there's, it's kind of like a, I, I approached it like a, an impressionist painting where you've got like this kind of very vague outline of things. Uh, but if you stare at it enough, you can kind of like fill in the spaces uh, and kind of the image comes together on its own. So a lot of these kind of strange uh, uh, pieces of geography and stuff, that, that's, that's, that's really kind of deliberate in some ways just to kind of uh, keep, keep the player's mind open and kind of bring their own interpretations of the story through that. 